was really very interesting. You could see all people standing around the tanks and try to explain to these young boys, to these soldiers, that nobody wants them here in Czechoslovakia, that we were happy in this uh, situation in our republic. You say them why you came. They said, we are your brothers, we are liberators. They say, no, it isn't true, you must see that there is no contra-revolution, that nobody wants you, that nobody needs your help. No, I'm your friend, I'm the brother, and we said that the brothers and the friends couldn't come on tanks, but they don't understand. This is Prague, Czechoslovakia and this film is being made in secret. Just to get into Czechoslovakia as a television team, we've had to join up with an underground movement and smuggle in cameras normally used for home movies. That's why the picture you're watching is not perfect. And the people I interview in this film know they are taking great risks just by talking to me, but they insist on speaking out, such as their courage and their commitment to freedom in Czechoslovakia. Isn't it strange that for all the ringing speeches in Brussels about European unity and our own obsessive concern with inflation, millions of our fellow Europeans are still not free to talk or read or write or sing or argue or travel as they would wish? And how long is it since we in Britain assumed that a European people like the Czechs willingly surrendered their democratic heritage for an imported fascism disguised as socialism? The people you will hear from are not an isolated few. They represent a peaceful struggle for freedom, as widespread as it was against the Nazis, as widespread as it was against the Kremlin when Russian tanks smashed into Prague in that summer of 1968. Do you remember? Please listen carefully to what these brave Europeans have to say. Since 68, and uh, uh, there, there was a very small group of people who remained free, paid for, for that freedom by uh, not being in the normal jobs or being in, 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 in very bad jobs and so on. I am absolutely not afraid. I, I write what, uh, what, uh, what I wish when I start to write. And that's exactly the reason why I cannot uh, get published. Yet concerning the Charter makes you virtually an outlaw in your own country. Why did you sign it? Yes, you do become an outlaw, but I did sign the charter. Why? Because in the first place, I think what is written is true, and secondly, I think there is a need to sign it, a need to do something. In Czechoslovakia, it really is high time to do something. I think that the charter is a start of the experiment of combining freedom and socialism. If you are interested in this, in this experiment, fine, come. I'm any, uh, uh, glad to, to meet anybody uh, interested in this experiment and in talking with him. This talking with him is so, so important for me that if I knew that tomorrow I'll go for, into prison for that, I shall talk with you anyway. Why should people have to go to prison because they sign a charter? In January this year, a group calling themselves Charter 77 announced their intention of informing the Prague regime of ways in which a state law protecting human rights was being broken. The people of Charter 77 are teachers, journalists, clerks, factory workers, housewives. They are Marxists and people who reject Marx. They are Christians and people of no special commitment. Their charter is a modest legal document asking only that the law of the state be upheld. 
that there be freedom of speech and worship, and that discrimination cease against those who claim these basic rights, such as thousands of children denied higher education because of their parents' beliefs. The charter was immediately banned, and those who signed it were arrested, intimidated, and stripped of their livelihood. But the word spread, and the number of people supporting the charter grew steadily. The response of the regime, which exists only as a kind of economic and military whore to the Kremlin, has been panic. It has tried to force people to sign an anti-charter, condemning a document most have never seen. In one factory, all but 22 of the 14,000 workers refused to attend a government rally against the charter. Such are the seeds of freedom in Czechoslovakia. Why, why did you sign the charter? Když jsem se seznámil s textem charty, tak uh, jelikož to, co tam je napsané, jsem s tím souhlasil. When I got to know the text of the charter, I found I agreed with it. I didn't hesitate, I signed. And then, when I reported for work, they gave me the sack. I protested. I said it was political discrimination. And they replied that it wasn't discrimination, it was dialectics. Well, I left. It was absurd. Anyway, I decided to put in an ad. So I went to one of our newspapers and handed in an ad that said, willing to accept any kind of employment, a signatory of Charter 77. They passed me from one to another, right up to the editor-in-chief. They all refused to accept the ad, and they refused to explain why they wouldn't accept it. They also refused to confirm in writing that they had refused to accept it. Charter uh, is uh, talking about uh, problems uh, which I have and my friends. Talking about freedom? Yes and freedom is a very, very ima imaginary uh, word for our, uh, our... People? Our, <laughs> our regime. I think that the most important uh, thing of the, on the Charter is that the people just wanted to say we don't want to, to get trodden at him anymore. And whatever happened, don't calculate the risks. You just, you just are, are, are beaten and beaten and beaten in, in, in mo most kind of things. And you just say no. What support have you had amongst your friends, ordinary people, people in the street, for what you did? Mm. Well, someone here in Czechoslovakia who is very concerned with what is happening with the Charter said to me, he said to me, you know, 13 million people here think the same as you do, but only a few have your courage. The courage of the few is personified by this man, Zdeněk Ubánek, an author whose books have been banned since 1948. He speaks good English, but often slowly and with hesitation, because the price of his courage has been a nervous breakdown. One cannot suppose that all the people in your country can know what, what happened here during court or history. Uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is quite important to remind British people, I, um, I think that uh, we, we really had a quite well-functioning democracy during the 20 years of freedom after, between 1918 and uh, 38. And might also, we could remind them that it was under the Munich Agreement that part of Czechoslovakia was ceded to uh, Hitler. Yes, it was an unfortunate moment of history for us because I'm afraid that uh, all what happens even now began just at the time. The accomplished fact of Nazis occupying Sudetenland has been another event rendering negotiations difficult. 
the British people could hardly know about the betrayal of Czechoslovakia. Like so much of what is called objective information, the news then was mostly shrill propaganda for government policy. And that policy, in 1938, was to appease Hitler. And here is the British Prime Minister preparing to give Czechoslovakia to the Nazis. I was a little boy. I used to repeat, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. That's what I'm doing. So Chamberlain tried and tried and tried again to let Hitler have Sudetenland, which was part of Czechoslovakia. And of course, with his boyish tenacity, he succeeded. What the admiring crowds did not realize, that his efforts were a prelude to World War II. Finally, the most popular arrival of all, to a world balancing on the brink of chaos, Mr. Chamberlain stands as the savior of peace, and in this character he is hailed even in German hearts. How horrible, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. It seems still more impossible. The people of the faraway country resisted the Nazis courageously, but they were powerless to stop them, just as they were powerless to stop the great powers carving up Europe in 1945, just as they were powerless to stop the Russian invasion in 1968 and the Helsinki Agreement in 1975, which, with the backing of the government of Harrow Wilson, further legitimized the Russian Empire and once again dismissed that faraway country. The world was divided with, between roughly two parts. And we, uh, we were given, I'm afraid, to the Eastern Bloc, to which uh, we don't belong by what I would call our democratic traditions. In the 60s, the Czechoslovak Communist Party began a determined and sophisticated movement to transform Czech society from a rigid bureaucratic class system imposed by the Soviet Union to a socialist democracy. Up to now, any attempt uh, for enlargement of freedom in socialism was interpreted as, as, a return, as an uh, attempt to return to capitalism and, and, and anything like that. What to do with it? I think that the only answer is to begin to think creatively in terms of socialism. These audacious attempts by the party to literally give back power to the people were unique in the history of socialism. Cenzura přestala, přátelé, existovat. Hurá! Myslím si, že svoboda slova v civilizovaném státě je úplně to základní. Protože je nelogické, aby se člověk tak dlouho učil mluvit a pak nesměl mluvit. about peace. I wish uh, that peace will rest here in Czechoslovakia. Czech uh, people this uh, song was many it was like uh, it was like uh, an anthem for them Is that yes right? yes and this 
you 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 recorded this song before the Russians came? Yes. Yes. In 1968, Marta Kubisova was the most popular woman singer in Czechoslovakia. To many, she was the symbol of the new democracy. After the Russians invaded, she dared to sing, O oh my country, let not fear and violence establish themselves on your soil. Keep yourself faithful and true. Shortly after this performance, pictures of a naked woman said to be Marta were circulated, and she found it impossible to get work as a singer. Even her driving license was taken away. Today, all her records are banned. Maybe is this mistake? Uh, is a photo, porno photo, uh, that impossible. But uh, 20 uh, concerts, a uh, performance was stopped. The show was stopped? Yeah, yeah. And I looked, uh, look at uh, never, never this photo. You, you never saw this no, photo? No, no. One feature of the persecution against the Chartists is that the government often withholds education from the children of those who signed the Charter. Does this mean that your 22-month-old child will grow up and have an inferior education because you, her mother, signed the Charter? I'm afraid that's how it is. Of course, I'm still fairly young, so I still believe that it won't turn out quite like that. I hope that before those eight, nine or ten years are up, before these things really begin to affect her, she will have a fair chance of an education. But even if she doesn't, we will have to arrange something else. Because I don't share the view of most of the people in this country that we should keep quiet on account of the children. On the contrary, I'm convinced that on account of the children, we should speak out. I have lived with censorship for so long, the author Zdenja Kabanik says, that the censor is no longer at his desk, he is in my head. After Ubanik signed the charter, he was interrogated for 12 hours, his house was searched, and his typewriter was taken away to be registered. If you write something uh, against the regime, all they have to do is look in their files, and they have your typewriter. Yes, yes, I, I'm afraid they do. Yes. Professor Jan Patochka was the charter spokesman. He was a much-loved philosopher. After he had dared to speak to the Dutch foreign minister in Prague, he was interrogated incessantly. He then had a heart attack, but his tormentors pursued him to his hospital bed, where the interrogations continued until he suffered a brain hemorrhage and died. He had the best possible death a human being can have, that at the end of his life, he was able to display basic accents of his philosophy and to die for that. At the funeral of Jan Patochka, a helicopter droned over his grave and motorcycles were revved to spoil the blessing and the greatest outpouring of grief for democracy since 1968. It was one of the best philosophers of our country. At the time of his funeral, I think there were about 300 signatories of the charter, but there were, I think, more than 1,000 people at the funeral. It's been nine years since the Prague Spring of Dubček when there was massive support for democracy in this country. What's happened to Czechs in those nine years? In the first place, a great illusion has vanished. And for most people, it has vanished for good. I think that what has happened since 1968 has made them think that nothing like that will work. That the sensible thing to do is to keep quiet and look after your family and your garden. And then there are a few people who don't think like that. And thank God, the youth, 
who, when they grow up, automatically begin to think a bit more freely. We hope there will be more and more of these young people. What can we do in the West to help? Well, you, you should mainly tell that the group called Charter 77 isn't a group of dissidents, it's so-called dissidents, but a group which represents the, uh, the feelings of many, many other people. I asked Julius Tamin how the Chartists were affected when people like President Carter spoke out about human rights. Well, I must say that I personally am uh, uh, really a little bit suspicious about sincerity of uh, uh, his uh, want really to help us and I don't think much uh, how he well I think well he helped that much we are not uh, uh, in prison uh, and it, it may be thanks to him uh, and many uh, other like uh, things like that but what I think that the Charter should be a start. And uh, the question of, uh, for, for, uh, before which we stand is how to de develop socialism freely. And to develop socialism freely, it doesn't mean to impose upon us the kinds of freedom you are living with. We must develop new concepts of freedom which, which come from, from, the, uh, from our own, own situation. And in, in, in uh, many uh, ways, this, uh, your, the voice of Carter is so strong in these freedoms that, that it may, so to, uh, so to say, deepen our initiative in developing the questions from our part and somehow in, in expecting that it will come from outside and it can't com come from outside. It must come from the inside. For many, the views in this film will no doubt fit the conventional Western image of communist Europe. What does not fit this image is what the Czechs themselves want. It seems to me that the last thing they want is to rush from the Soviet camp to the American camp. Many of them don't trust the human rights campaign of President Carter, and already they see the American and Soviet delegates to the Belgrade Conference on Human Rights agreeing not to be too critical of each other and of each other's imperial backyards. You see, the Czechs look back at their history and they know that any alliance between great powers, whether it's called Munich or Detente, is bad news for them, because it means that small countries in the middle, like Czechoslovakia, are expendable, no matter what camp they're in. Like most small nations, the Czechs want to go a third way, their own way. In spite of all the years of oppression, they've never forgotten their democratic traditions, and it's fair to guess that a majority of them want their country to be socialist, democratic, and fiercely independent. Charter 77, a new beginning of this democracy, was partly inspired by the courage of a Czech pop group called the Plastic People of the Universe, which was banned and brutalized by the regime. In one of their last songs, the group sang these words about their oppressors. They, that's the regime, are afraid of the old for their memory. They're afraid of the young for their innocence. They're afraid of the graves and the flowers people put on them. They're afraid of those who aren't in the party. They're afraid of singers, tennis players, Santa Claus, archives, each other. They're afraid of truth. They're afraid of freedom. They're afraid of democracy. They're afraid of socialism. So why the hell are we afraid of them? Do you ever feel afraid? Me? Yes. About me? Do you ever feel afraid living with all the difficulties you have? Yes. Yes, but sometime, and sometime I am better. Do you feel afraid talking to us? Talking? No, no. Say, so, uh, it, it is. Um, it is true, all. 
Would you sing Martha's prayer? Oh, I must so. At me, da, zůstává s touto krajinou. Slova závislá.